My name is Jill Coyle, and from years of experience as a divorce attorney, I know for a fact that no one dies from divorce. The experts and I are here to show you how to not only survive, but thrive during the most difficult times. Welcome to another episode of No One Dies from Divorce. Today, my special guest, Kathleen Martinez, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited for Kathleen. I've been following you on um, social media for a little bit. And um, what super intrigued me, obviously, you're a powerhouse in what you do. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But you and I have very similar stories and backgrounds about where we have come from to get to where we are today. Um, And I love that because um, not only am I a champion of women, but I'm a champion of women in the legal field and you are doing that exact same thing. So um, I'm really excited to meet you. Me too. I I love hearing, you know, other, other, I feel like we're such a minority still, maybe not as women, but women who I guess are champions of other women in the legal field as well. I don't hear a lot from other female attorneys as well. So I'm super stoked. Yeah. And I wore pink for you because thank you. <laughs> because I'm I'm gonna introduce my listeners and then I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my backstory so you kind of understand and then we'll hear exactly your story. So I'm really excited about this. So okay. At, at the start of her career, she was treated poorly by male colleagues because she didn't fit in with the culture. Instead of trying to fit in, she created her own firm that embraces femininity and especially the color pink. Kathy Martinez has paved her own path in the law community and has been dubbed the real life Elwoods. Woods. What? Like it's hard. Kathy Martinez handles both family-based and employment-based immigration cases and is licensed to practice law in Texas. She receives her BA at Mount St. Mary's University in Los Angeles and her doctor of law at Thomas Jefferson School of Law in San Diego. Kathleen founded Martinez immigration to help immigrants gain legal status at an affordable cost. Her mission is to help unite families easily and effectively. Kathleen's husband, Alejandro Martinez, is a first-generation Mexican-American immigrant, and together Kathleen and Alejandro have dedicated their lives toward reuniting families here in the United States. Kathleen enjoys using her social media platform to empower women, immigrants, and underrepresented communities. Further, Kathleen creates a content dedicated towards educating immigrants on their green card options. Kathleen also created a virtual law firm for the purposes of helping clients all over the country with a cost-effective approach. Wow. Um, thank you so much for being here. Of course. I mean, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I, so, so I'll tell you a little bit about my backstory and, um, I, I've wanted to be a lawyer since I was little and I, um, the first, it wasn't, I had done some legal stuff in, um, high school. I worked for a judge, But when I went to law school, um, I, the first judge that I worked for, so it was my first summer clerking and I was working for a woman judge, super excited. She was really well respected in the community and I was just clerking for her. So most of the time I wasn't even in court, right? I was back in the back, you know, researching or doing whatever. And she, um, um, one day I wore a white skirt and like a just more springy shirt to, Mm -hmm. it was still a dress, but it was very, very non-black and it was just a really fun spring. And she asked me if I wanted to sit in on, um, I think it was, um, it was just argument with attorneys. It wasn't no jury. Anyways, I was like, sure, that'd be great. So here I am sitting in court totally fine. Nobody really notices me or sees me. And after we got done, we, she calls me back into her office and she proceeds to berate me and basically scold me for what I wore to court. And I remember thinking, first of all, like, what? Like, aren't we like in the 21st century? Well, this was in 2004. I'm old, but, um, but I was like, what, what is going on here? And it stayed with me through my career. I remember, I am very, very specific about what I wear now when it goes to, to court, because it, it, it like, it, it just put this like 
cloud of, oh, well, I don't want to be like known as that person that like makes the judge mad because I'm wearing something different. And, um, and I just remember that it just made me feel really bad about myself. Um, and it was from a woman judge, right. You know, you know, better than anybody. And I'm sure we can talk about this is that sometimes women in the legal field are even worse at supporting women than. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so anyways, that was like one of my first, you know, examples of feeling like I was being a little bit like discriminated against for just being a woman and just wanting to be, you know, feminine um, in a job that is not looked at as very feminine. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I've, I've, I've been there and it, your point about other women is so true. Cause I was trained under like older Texas attorneys who were kind of the first in their class kind of thing. Um, and they acted like, like worse than the men. <laughs> and I think it's because that's how they were trained. You know, they had to like fit in, they had to prove themselves. And they almost thought that like, they had to train me to be the same way, to be taken seriously. I'm like, why are we not breaking the barriers here? Yeah, absolutely. So I went to law school in Houston. Um, and my first job was in a small town outside of Houston, England, Ingleton. And yeah. my boss was a male, but he like super Southern Baptist. And I come from Utah, you know, it's a very Christian state, but not um, Southern Baptist at all. And um, that was my first job as an attorney to where I was made to feel less than because of my religious beliefs. And my boss would particularly bring me into his office and talk to me about it. And, um, and then I found out, so this is just where my story anyways, I found out I was pregnant when I had worked for him for almost seven, eight months. Um, I decided to tell him early on because I wasn't going to quit and I didn't want, um, you know, I, I just thought that that was like, okay. It was my first baby. Never had this experience. Yeah. I told him on a Friday, Kathleen, no joke. The next Monday he pulled me in his office and he let me go. Oh, oh my God. (laughs) And there was nothing I could do because it was a very small firm. They were, I wasn't protected by FEMLA. And even if I was like, even I hadn't worked for him for a year and no HR, nothing like that. Yeah. And I just remember sitting there afterwards, like, you know, wallowing with my husband thinking maybe I wasn't supposed to be a lawyer. Like it, it crushed me Yeah. to, yeah. And, um, and it was just really, really hard. Um, but my husband was like, Nope, you need to be a lawyer. And so luckily I got back in, but, but I want to fast forward to, this is where our story really matches up. So I moved to Utah and I worked my way up through three firms into this big law firm where I came in as a fifth year associate. I was working, um, creating amazing business and I was going to be shareholder probably within a year and a half, two years of being at this firm. My woman, I had a woman, um, immediate superior and, um, again, super horrible, bad experience. And then my managing partner was Mel. I was one of eight women in a firm of 130 women. Um, which I'm sure you can, um, understand and relate to. And I had never felt more alone than in that firm. Um, yeah. I was pregnant with my third child. Now this was, you know, fast forward seven years and I had, they had no maternity leave written out in their policies. Um, so I had no idea what they were going to expect me. If I was expected to work, if I was expected to make up hours, I had no idea what was going to happen. Um, and I had this really high conflict with my immediate superior that the men just didn't want to help with and, and just were super discriminatory of. I realized really, really quickly, and um, I'm sorry for talking so much, but I wanted to just share this because I want to talk about your story next is that I realized really quickly that the person I was, was never going to be able to shine working for other people in the legal field. And um, I was six months pregnant and I left the comfort of that big firm to go start Coil Law. And just like you, you know, in, um, I don't think I've done it as fast as you, man, you're, you're just on a, on a 
tirade. You're doing so amazing. But in eight years, you know, multi-million dollar firm, I have 25 employees. We're just, we're just doing what we needed to do. And it was only me taking that risk going out on my own that I was yeah. able to really set the platform. And I'm really proud of my companies, Kathleen, because I'm doing exactly what you're doing. Women first. I am the first, um, you know, in my, I have two separate firms that are ch women champion women. We have full on maternity, you know, work, work from home. We have everything in place to make it so that women can thrive in this legal field. And I'm really, really proud of it. The governor just, you know, um, recognized us as top 100 companies in Utah for champion women. So, so that's my story. And I wanted to, anyways, it, I get you and I see what you're doing and man, I'm proud of you. I love it. Every single bit of it. So now I'm going to stop talking because I want my listeners to hear your story. Yeah. Okay. For sure. No, no. I, I love your story and I can relate to it so much. I mean, it's, it's almost giving me like, like PTSD because of everything you went through. I always felt like I was the only one. And I actually questioned whether I was good enough to be a lawyer too. I was like, maybe oh this God. is just not the career for me. And it's so funny because I, felt like that my entire life, even before I was in college, I went to this like preppy Jesuit, uh, private high school, like Catholic. And, um, I, my parents didn't really have the money then. So it was definitely kind of like, um, one of, I, I wasn't poor, but I wasn't rich and the rich kids, I just like dominated that school. And I remember all the, all the boys would like constantly like make fun of me for wearing too much makeup for wearing pink, you know, for, they always just like stereotype me. And I got teased all the time. And I remember like not wearing makeup for years. Cause I was like, that's, that's how the boys will take me seriously. And I'm like, I, I'm like, so like mad at myself for even giving a 16 year old boy <laughs> that kind of value over for me or that kind of power. Um, and I think about that. I'm like, God, I should have just like done whatever I wanted. But obviously, you know, I didn't have confidence back then. And a lot of women in that, you know, teenage women don't really have confidence in general, but then you give the power to men to determine how good you are in anything, especially in school. I'm like, I think that's where it started for me. Um, and then, you know, I went to an all girls college, which absolutely changed my life. Um, you know, when, when you're learning and growing and you're at that young, vulnerable age in your twenties, but you're only around women, it is like, you just see things differently. Like it's, you know, secular. Like I was, I was encouraged to apply to law school, even though I struggled academically and I was told that I was good enough and I was championed and supported versus being in class and wondering like, what will the boy in the class think of me if I answer my question or if I look a certain way while I'm I'm speaking in class. It's just crazy. Um, and so that's when I realized I'm like, I, it took an all girls college for me to realize that I'm good enough one. But then of course, like that was great. But you know, then I went to law school and law school, I liked law school, but it was like, you know, your summer internships. So I, I interned at this firm. Um, and it was, it was something out of like mad men. And this is San Diego, pretty progressive in like 2016. Right. But like, this this firm, all the men were lawyers and they each had their own female assistant who, you know, they were like 20, attractive, you know, hired for a certain reason, right? Um, and it was crazy because it was me and two other girls from my school. We were the summer interns and we never, and the firm was so divided by gender that we never really knew where we fit. And they had like firm lunches where they go out every Friday and all the attorneys would go and then all the staff would like have their own lunch where they, you know, they would buy us lunch and we'd sit at home or we sit at the office. But I never knew because I'm like, well, we're technically about to be attorneys. We're working with the attorneys. So like we mistakenly followed them to lunch and they're like, no, you stay back with the girls. I'm like, OK. <laughs> and I was like, what? year is it you know what i mean i'm like why don't you want me to go to lunch with you like i'm trying to learn from you you know what i mean um and then there was like this mailroom boy that got hired out of high school and he was invited to lunch with them and i was like now i see how this is and i could not believe what was happening and i remember like i i worked for like the biggest partner and he was just such a douche like he was horrible misogynistic and i remember like he would give me such minimal work and I would speak up. I would send him emails and I'd be like, can you give me a little bit more challenging work? And I'm really trying to learn from you, see if like it, it was insurance defense, kill me, but I see if it works for me, you know what I mean? And he had taken me into a meeting with another partner and he was like, you are too difficult. You want too much. You don't blend in with the firm. We're going to let you go and not offer for you a job. So that was like my first firing. And I, it wasn't really because of the quality of my work or anything. It was because of me asking for better work pretty much. And um, I remember my confidence was just shot because I was like, I'm never going to get a job. 
Um, but you know, I ended up studying for the bar and all of that anyways. And then I get to, I mean, so then I'm moving to Cal to Texas, right. And naive about Texas, but thinking like, you know, it's fairly progressive in some areas, but I, I got a job working for an oil company. So I guess that was on me for not realizing how backwards I was traveling <laughs> in time where I took this job. <laughs> so I, I take this job and it's so funny. Cause it's like this dinky little oil company in San Antonio and my manager is this nice young guy who had taken the bar five times and he was really nice to me. And I hadn't, I was studying for the bar while I was working for him. So I was like a clerk. I hadn't gone past the bar yet, but he was really great to me. We went out to lunch. We talked, like he mentored me. But the minute I passed the bar exam, I was at work that day. He looked straight up at me and he was like, I did not think you would pass. And he just told me that. And I was like, why? <laughs> you did, even though it took you five times. So maybe that's, maybe that's why he thought that like, it should take me five times too. And so when I passed, his demeanor changed towards me. He was very, very controlling of what work I would get. He tried to give me as little work as possible. Um, and eventually he had the owner fire me for not fitting in with the culture of the firm. And I'm pretty sure he was terrified that I was going to take his spot. Um, because like, here I am coming in doing good work and passing the bar first time. It took him five times. I'm, I mean, like, I don't even know if his work was good, but like, he was so threatened that he had me fired. Like he couldn't have just like worked with me. I could have helped him out. You know what I mean? Um, and so then I was like, okay, I'm going to work for an all girls, like a family law firm here in Dallas. And I was definitely, you know, it was better than working for the other companies, like working with men, I felt better comfortable working for a female attorney, but she was old school. She was like in her sixties. She had been, you know, trained with the boys to be aggressive, to be a pit bull. And she was constantly telling my, telling me that I need to be a certain way. She would yell and scream at me because, and some, I think one time I finally like uh, confronted her. I was like, you can't treat me like this. Like you can't be like this anymore. And she was like, well, I'm sorry. It's just, that's how I was trained. And that's what made me such a good attorney. I'm like, there's no way that you need to be like this to be a good attorney. Yeah. She was super abusive. Yeah. And I remember we had like a receptionist who came into my office crying because she had blue nails and my boss, the female attorney threatened to fire her for wearing blue nails, you know, because of like, she was like, you're not going to be taken seriously. My, you know, my firm is going to be a joke if someone comes in and books appointment and see that you have blue nail polish. And I was like, my God, you know, it's like, it was even worse. Like you said, you think it a female attorney would be different. And I'm like, I think, and then I realized like, it has to change with my generation. We're just di different, you know? And so, yeah, when I started my firm, it's funny because pink was more just incidental. Like I wanted it as an accent color in my company because I like the color pink in my websites. When I was designing my website, I was like, I like it, but I was still in that mindset. Like I can't be too pink because then I won't get clients. You know what I mean? And then I could finally afford a billboard and my husband's like, make it neon pink. I'm like, why would I do that? And he told me, he was like, people will remember you for the pink. He's like, there's immigration attorneys everywhere, but they won't forget the pink immigration attorney with a pink billboard. So I did it as an experiment, got a lot of cases that way. So I guess that's how the pink, you know, like got its way in there. And then it became, I guess, more of a movement and less of a personal preference when I posted a TikTok in like August talking about, you know, my experience being, you know, discriminated against for being a woman and how I looked and then creating a firm where that literally doesn't matter. It's almost our purpose to point out that we can wear pink and also be smart and do well. Um, so I guess it's more of a personal brand now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, yeah, it's just fun, funny. I never thought about it when I like had pink in my website. I was like, it's because I like it. Like, I don't really care. But yeah, now it, it, it means a lot more. And I'm so glad because I still feel like the legal field, even though there's so many women in it, is so behind. It's so old school. And, and because I have 10 to 20 to 30 people messaging me every day, like, can I work for you? I work for Goldman Sachs or like, I'm a nurse, but do you need a nurse? Because I hate how I'm treated. And it's crazy that it's still at that point. You know what I mean? It's, it's really sad. And, um, you know, I, so I created coil law, which we do family law. Um, and then I, I had been doing personal injury on the side just because, um, you know, you have friends and family that ask you and I'm like, sure, I'll take a personal injury case. Um, and it was the lack of females in personal injury that really like piqued my interest to be like, why do we see billboards all over of personal injury, um, attorneys, but we don't see any women and there's women that practice personal injury, but they are not the forefront. They're not the owners of these firms. And I said, I can change yeah. that. So that's why I started Moxie Law. 
And now we're in Utah and Texas and I'm licensed in both Utah and Texas. And cool. I, um, and you know, our goal is to put women on billboards all over the country eventually. Um, kind of like what you're doing in this movement. Um, because it's so interesting too, because when you break down the statistics of people that when they feel comfortability in finding an attorney, um, you in, in specific areas, especially personal injury, they want a woman attorney, but you can't find one. And, um, and you know, what we're doing on our level is to, is to eliminate that is to bring us to the forefront so that you can see, Hey, we're over here and we're here to do better work, um, champion you, you know, in a different way. Um, yeah. And and what I love that you've done is you've built, you know, you, you're just not in Texas. Like you've built like this national now, um, immigration law firm, correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Cause we're federal. So it's nice. So, I mean, we do have a small brick and mortar here, but just kind of use it for like mail. <laughs> um, I mean, we're, we're mainly virtual. So all of our employees work from home from different States, uh, because immigration is really, it's mainly like paperwork. So, um, we've, we've turned our firm 100% virtual. Everything's off of software cloud-based systems. So we mail our clients or applications and they mail it out. Um, and we're able to help them in all 50 States because of that. That's so amazing. And do you, nice. do you employ only women or? No, no, we do, we do have, yeah, we do have males, uh, working for us. We just, it's funny. And people think that we only employ women, but it's just, we attract women for obvious reasons. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, so yeah, we have nothing but women wanting to work for us and, um, paralegals are just female, you know, more female than males are paralegals, especially immigration paralegals. So we just get a lot of female applications versus men. Yeah. I love that. I'm writing a book right now. Um, I think I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm calling it finding your moxie and, um, it's, you know, a little bit of my story, but then talks a lot about how the challenges women face with women supporting women. Um, yeah. and I, I, because I've had, you know, a couple other women, um, you know, superiors as well. And I felt just like you said, like, I felt like, um, you know, they just felt like they had to maybe yell louder because they felt like, you know, they, they had earned their place wherever they were. And so, and, um, I remember when I started my firm, I was like, well, the good news is I haven't really had a good boss, but I've had enough bad bosses that I can say, okay, this is what I don't want to do. Right. Um, you kind of learn from that. Yeah. And I've been able to create a culture. I mean, my whole goal in life is to champion women and, you know, it's hard. I've, I've, I've realized that, that there's a lot of women, first of all, that don't take it as genuine. And there's a lot of women that push back on that yeah. um, because um, I, I don't know if it's because you feel like if you're champion women, then you're like somehow belittling men, which is completely wrong because I have, um, you know, a pretty equal split of men and women in my, my companies. But, um, but I just want to be that person to let women know that you can stand and shine in your own space. And right. if you can't, just like you, come work for me because I'll give you that place to shine and we'll create something pretty special. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you, you make a good point about it being challenging because I've, I've had employees who are, you know, a little bit more conservative and they don't see it as genuine and they don't really care for it, but they don't realize how badly they need it. You know what I mean? They don't, and you know, and it's funny because I've, I've been with that with some, I've had some employees not do good work or not really work or get a little bit lazy or they're struggling. And I always try to like take an approach where I'm like, what's going on? What can I do to change our relationship, to help you and your work product? And they're like, well, you know, I, they're like, I, you're supposed to be championing women. Then why are you getting me in trouble? <laughs> I'm like, it can't, you know, I'm like, I want to be your support so that you can be better. Um, so people don't really understand what it is and what it means as well. And like, I'm giving you a place to work. You still have to work, but I'm certainly not going to not support you. So it's, it's hard to find a way to support people where people think it's genuine as well. Yeah. I see that as well. We get some people that come into our firm and I almost feel like we have to like break down their past, like trauma and we have yeah. to work through that so that they yeah. can trust us in what we are wanting to do for them. Cause I'm going to give you a safe place to be the best that you can be. 
if mm-hmm. you don't want to join the team and you don't want to put in your weight, then we, you know, we're going to look for somebody else. But a lot of times I see that I see, man, you have some trauma that you're dealing with from your past yeah. employers. And so we're going to work through that and we're going to continually build you up so that you can be the best that you can be. And I agree with you, Kathleen. It's sometimes hard. It's really exhausting sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, but yeah, you're right. It's exhausting. Cause like you have a certain mission and you want to help people, but they also have to work <laughs> yeah. and you also want people to help. It's a, it's such a two-way relationship. You know, they don't, they don't just work for you. You work for them, but you have to be on the, the same page. Yeah. I also love your relationship with your husband. Um, I I've seen a couple of your social media posts about it. Um, my husband is very, very similar to you. Like, um, you know, he's very successful, makes good money. Um, he's, I supported them through medical school and residency why he finished. Wow. Um, and, and now he's over here on the same, it, just like your husband, your post the other day just made me giggle. Cause it was like where he was saying, Oh, I'm this big CEO of this company. And here's my wife making like all this money. And I was like, boo. Yeah. Like that's, that's <laughs> my husband and I's relationship. And I know I couldn't do it without him. He's like my hundred percent, like cheerleader. He's the one, like, you know, that I'm like, shooting like off all of my, um, I don't know if you feel this way, but like as a boss, do you feel like you can't be emotional as a boss? Like, even though I'm a very emotional person, you have to be very pragmatic. You have to be a great listener. You have to be very, very understanding. So me being an, a very, very emotional person, I sometimes like, I, you know, and so he's like my therapist, like I decompress with him. I, I tell him all my frustrations and it helps me to be able to then like refocus and get back on track with what I need to be for my employees. Yeah. My husband's an an engineer. So if anything, he's like way less emotional than even he should be. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And yeah, he kind of sees everything in a detailed analytical way where I'm like, not to say like, I'll be emotional. And, and, and like, he kind of sets me on the right path. And he's like, okay, let's look at everything logically. Remember, let's have perspective. But at the same time, he's so detail oriented that he's kind of a tree through the forest kind of guy. So he, he fails to see the big picture where I can help him. And I'm like, I'm more of a big picture person, but a little bit more sloppy on the details. So we kind of fit each other that way, which is like, thank God I, I need him. I, I get how you feel. That's so good. My husband's like the safest person ever. So all of the risks I've taken with my companies, with, you know, everything he would never do without me. And so it's, (laughs) I'm, I'm, he always laughs. He's like, Nope, you, you do you because you have become as successful as you are because of you. So anyways, I love that, but he does keep me in check. Cause I'm always like, Oh, let's start this business or let's go into that. And he's like, no, no, no. You're already so busy as it is. Let's just get this going. Oh my God. Same. Yeah. My husband keeps me in place. Like, yeah, exactly. I have all that. I'm like, I'm a dreamer like you and a little bit more emotional. And I'm like, I want to do this, this, and this. And he's like, you only have 24 hours in the day. (laughs) Yeah. That's exactly right. And then you have kids. Yeah. So we have a a one-year-old boy and a three-year-old boy. So they're little. So there's also that it's hard. Do you have kids? I do. I have four. Oh my gosh. You get it. Yeah, I get, I totally get it. And, um, and that's exactly what he says. He's like, you still have this little thing called a family. And I'm like, oh yeah, you're right. So I, um, so just to kind of tie it back to like what you do, your immigration, like, um, so, so it sounds like, so you did, um, you were doing insurance defense, which I agree with you. Yuck. Um, yeah. And then you were doing oil and gas, which I had to take that on the bar. You did too. Yeah. Um, I had to take a whole class in law school, which you didn't, which means you no. had to study for the, I had to study for, and I was like, this is bizarre. Like the, the Texas bar was so, this is before you be, but it was so weird. Like the oil and the gas, the security, like the, just the weird, like areas of law that I'll never, ever have to know in real life. <laughs> no it's... wonder it was so hard. Oh, it's so true. And I passed that one. And then I took the Utah bar less than two years later, but because it was right at the two year mark, I had to take the freaking ethics test again too. So I took that twice and two bars. And that was way before, cause I took the Utah bar in 2010. So, um, anyways, yeah, I agree. It's like useless information, but, um, luckily we don't have to take it re-up it like my husband's medical board. So that's annoying. Oh my my God. 
never i don't think there, there'd be way less lawyers if we had to do that <laughs> seriously so so what brought you then to immigration um yeah it's so funny so my husband moved, works for toyota and he his job moved him around a lot and this is when i was having like my first kid and i mean we kind of decided like he was the money maker and i was pregnant so i'm like i'm not i'm gonna put my career on hold so we can move for your job i'm like but eventually we got to move back to Texas. We're in license. So we're like, we'll just do two years. I won't work. I'll raise my kid. And then, you know, naturally I went crazy after about a year, you know, uh, and, and like, it was like three months after having my baby, I was like, I have to work, <laughs> you know, and, I, and, and you constantly think, and it's for other women, it's like, I need something to do or I need money. But for me, I was constantly thinking about, I did not work this hard to not work. You know, yeah. I was like, I didn't, the bar exam still gives me PTSD in law school. I'm like, I got to do something with this. I'm like, and also we can be so much more financially comfortable than we are now. Like, because I have this license, it's not like I, you know, I'm a regular person. I'm like, I have this ability to make money if I wanted to. So, but we were living in Oregon for a minute for his job. And I was like, I'm not taking the Oregon bar. Cause I knew we weren't going to stay there. I knew we wanted to go back to Texas. And so I got a job for an immigration firm because that's an area of law that I could take, that I can learn without studying for the bar. Um, I was also in my family law firm dipping into immigration a little bit with my family law clients. Cause you know, Texas. And so I was helping them a lot with like basic stuff and kind of self training. And I thought it was really interesting work. And I realized when I was in family law, that my clients were a lot nicer to me when I was helping them with immigration versus family, <laughs> you know, they're, they're a lot happier. And I'm like, I really like making people happy versus divorcing them. So I'm like, this might be a good area. And it's a great business model, by the way, because like I said, it's federal, you can help people in all 50 states, and you can do it entirely virtually over the computer. You don't have to have an office, you barely have to go to court if you don't want to. It's you can you can, you know, turn in a lot more business than like a traditional firm that's just state specific. So um, I learned under a family law attorney and then I, you know, I quit after about a year and started my own firm in the pandemic. So, you know, the pandemic, I was almost, I think I was about to get laid off. So I kind of quit anyway. And I knew I wanted to start on my own. So I was home with my kids and I was pregnant. My first kid, I was pregnant my second. And I was like, I'm going to start doing like small green card services online, you know, through like Facebook and Instagram. Um, I didn't have the goal of starting a firm. I was just like, I didn't have the money or the time or the childcare. So I was like, I'm just going to do small services, but I decided to make a TikTok one day that blew up. And then I'm getting like all these messages to help them get a green card. I'm like, I don't even have a website, <laughs> you know, like that wasn't, I didn't prepare for that. I didn't have the goal of starting a firm. So once I started getting all the business, I was like, okay, I guess I'm creating a law firm. So I set it up and then, you know, I, I was able to hire an assistant and it kind of blew up from there. But because of TikTok, that's where we get 100% of our business. Um, that's where, you know, I was kind of almost forced into creating a law firm, which is just crazy. So yeah, that's kind of how I got into immigration. I'm definitely staying because I'm like, I don't know, I feel like we're probably going to move again. <laughs> and, you know, I, I don't have to stay in Texas, which is great. And the summers are just, they're, I don't know about you, but they're killing me. Like I wasn't raised here. So the summers I'm like, I don't know if I could do another summer of triple digit heat. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm like, I think we have to move. Like we, I, I think it's getting hotter and hotter. And I'm like, I kind of want to move like back to California maybe, or we could have two houses a bit, but I was like, either way, I've got to get out for the summers and I'm, I'm not taking another bar exam. No way. <laughs> that's funny. And that's great for what you do. I love that. We just moved here in August. So I only experienced the the heat wave for a few months and we don't still own a house in Utah. So we are, the plan is to be back there for most of the summer anyways, but I totally sure. understand um, that that's so great. And social media is such a power and for what you're doing, like, it's so important. Um, I'm all over social media, definitely not as popular as you, but um, you know, I'm just trying to make a difference wherever I can. And um, and that's what you're doing. And that's what I love about. You. So your TikToks, like, I was like, I need her on my podcast. That's what I told my <laughs> assistant, because I said, even though like immigration and family law, we could talk more about that and how that ties in a lot. That's kind of boring, but I really, I connected with you because of your story. Um, and I was like, that's, it's just really special. And, um, and you are such a good example for other women for what, for doing this work. Um, I don't really talk about my personal story like you do on social media. And so I was really excited, 
Um, in fact, I don't even know if I've said that entire story that I said today anywhere. Um, but I wanted to share it. You with should, you because- my God, because you're the first attorney to tell me like the first attorney to tell me they have basically the exact same story. He's been successful, but it was constantly questioning like whether you're good enough to be an attorney while being successful as an attorney. I mean, that's just such a crazy paradox within itself. Right. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, hearing that makes me feel better. Cause I thought I was very much alone. I was like, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. Like how are the, all these other women working at firms and doing well, but they probably weren't, they're probably experiencing the same crap that we were experiencing, but we didn't talk about it. You know what I mean? That's why, that's why my, I really do want to write a book, um, talking about the champion of women in the legal field. We should collaborate and write a book together because, um, because this is my new endeavor. I want to do some consulting for female women that want to start firms. Yeah. So many women don't think that they have the ability to do it. And just like you, well, what did you do your undergraduate in? Um, poli sci. I've yeah, got, so, I would have done it over, I would have done like Spanish or something smarter. It, that's <laughs> exactly me. I did it in poli sci too, because that's what my counselor said I should do when I wanted to go to law school. I would have done it in business or English, you know, business. build yes. up my oh, writing oh my skills. God. Yeah. And so poli many women are idea. like, oh, I want to start my own firm, but I don't even know where to start. And they can't go hire, you know, like a big, and I'm like, I'm going to do some consulting on that. And and let women hire me and I'll consult you and I'll tell you everything I did and I'll do the, you know, all the mistakes and all the, you know, for you, you're going to have to talk about the, you know, most people won't grow as fast as you because you blew up because of social media, which is amazing. Um, you know, I already had the reputation when I started, but what do you do when you start from scratch? Like, I, I think women like you and I could really help guide women into doing that and, and giving them the encouragement and the, um, you know, the push to say you can do it. So, um, so yay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know. Right. Like we, we should, we should guide. And it's funny because I have a lot of like college students and high school students, like, what should I do to get into law school? Does where I go to law school matter? How do you study for the L side? I'm like, it's so funny because I didn't really have anyone directly telling me how to do that either. It's like, we just figured it out or poor college counseling, my God, and high school counseling, even worse. (laughs) You know, I would like to tell anyone, like, stop listening to your high high school counselor and just, you know, maybe have an actual lawyer tell you how to do it and a successful lawyer. So you're so, you're so right on that. Like a book. I mean, that's awesome. That's a great idea. So it's funny because I actually got into Thomas Jefferson. So when I went to law school in 2004, that was when that was the Elwood's like life. Like you had, yeah. you needed a 168 to get into Harvard. The, yeah. um, you know, it was the highest year of applications for any law school year yeah. ever. And I didn't get into the schools I wanted in Utah. So when I was, so I got into like Gonzaga and I got into Thomas Jefferson and I got into Texas Southern. That's where I went. No joke. I yeah. went to Texas Southern in Houston and I get, you know, and everybody, when I went, decided to go to Texas Southern, I made that decision for one reason only. It was the cheapest law school. And I was yeah. like, I was like, I, I don't know what I went want. there because of that. It's so funny. I didn't, I could have gone to Thomas Jefferson, but I was like, I didn't want to pay that tuition. And my, my brother-in-law actually went to Thomas Jefferson the same year as I, and I could have gone to law school with them and been with my sister. And I, I decided to go the cheap route to Houston. And I get a lot of questions like, well, doesn't your law school matter? And I'm like, nope, no, no, not at all. And people, and that's a whole nother argument is people thinking they need to go to a top 10 school. And then they work in big law and they're really depressed and they're really unhappy. Suicide rates are huge there. You know what I mean? And I'm like, oh my God, no, you just need to pass the bar and have a good business mindset. You know, the goal is to not work for someone else. My God. And you can go to any school to be able to do that. So true. You're either going to build your own empire or have, or help somebody else build theirs. And exactly. um, you know, and I'm, I'm really grateful for the empires you and I are building. It's, it's, it's a good space and it's needed and you are right. Like we're in 2023. Where, where's everybody else? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's so true. You're right. It's so funny. And it's like, you never know with, with women. Like I see we, I belong to these like immigration groups on Facebook of immigration lawyers where they've talked bad about like me and other TikTok attorneys. And I'll see them because other attorneys will tell me about it. 
and they're still in a different genre of like like lawyering and as well as a different decade like the the bullying they have and the, the way they picked apart the way I look and they're like and, you know, I'm like, I know that these lawyers just don't know how to do business and they're mad that I'm getting business through something as easy as TikTok. You know what I mean? And I'm, I'm and you're right. And it's like, you know, I wish they could just ask me for their help because I'd help them in a second because I didn't have anybody help me, you know? And there's so many of us who like, I would love, we could like you and I could like help people grow and champion them and support them in their marketing. But it's true. A lot of, a lot of lawyers aren't good business people and we're not exactly trained to be good business people or entrepreneurs in law school either. A law school is so theoretical. And I feel like it didn't prepare me at all. Oh yeah. And we're so logical and we're not yeah. risk takers. You have to be a risk yeah. taker to start your own business and you have you to be it. able to put up with the naysayers. Kathleen, yeah. I, I, my entire career, I've had these naysayers. People tell me I'm not good enough. And I still have the same people say that about me, you know? And so I'm, I'm grateful that we could connect because just don't even listen to them. Like I know you, right? what you're doing is special and girl, if I looked like you, I'd be doing the same thing. Like you're amazing. <laughs> you're beautiful. You're talented. And, um, you connect with people in a level that they need to be connected with. So thank you. That don't ever so let anybody me. make you feel less than. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the, the key because I think, you know, the, the more successful you get, people will always hate. And I think that's a good thing. You know, you, you learn to realize that like you're doing something right. <laughs> that's what I've had to kind of tell myself. And this year, my new year's resolution was that I am just not going to give a F I won't say the word. Um, but I am not going to give an F about what other people think about me. Cause I exactly. know what I'm doing is special and I know what I'm doing is important. And yeah. I have 25 families that depend on me and what we're doing here. And those are the only opinions that matter. So, and then obviously the thousands of clients, the hundreds of clients that we help every year. So um, you're doing the same thing. Thank you. Appreciate it. I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by, I mean, the fact that you have two firms and that the way you've grown, I love it. I mean, you're, you're such a business woman within yourself and a risk taker. I think that's what makes you successful. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I want everybody to know where to find you if they need your okay. services or if they just go follow her on social media. It's so fun. Yeah. My, my links in the bio is easy link tree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So just go look her up. Your law firm is called Martinez immigration, right? Correct. That's awesome. So Kathleen, thank you so much. Thanks for sharing your story. I loved this and girl, you keep wearing pink and don't worry. I mean, I, I have, I have bright suits now. I, I try to write, you know, I, it. I, I do what I need to do to feel empowered. And, um, and, you know, we still have issues. I, um, just the last story I had trial just a year ago, right. I've been practicing almost 15 years now. Um, I'm, I have opposing party on the stand and I'm crossing her. I'm sitting in my chair. I'm not being overly aggressive, but I am being very, very poignant and I'm yeah. nailing my cross, which yeah. is what I'm good at. Yeah. And she was very, very uncomfortable and did not like it. And she ended up breaking down, kind of crying. And the wow. judge proceeded, the man judge proceeded to look at me and say, okay, we're done for today. And I was like, what? And it kind of made me mad because I was almost done. I wanted to be done like with her cross before we ended the day, whatever. We show up the next morning and before he, uh, maybe it was that night and he proceeded, he let the clients go. And then he proceeded to berate me for being so aggressive in my cross. I wasn't <gasps> standing. I was not, um, you know, I, I have never, uh, I have had men like, you know, be very, very, um, demeaning in the way that, you know, I am, but I felt so little right there where he was accusing me of being even overly emotional. I mean, it was, there was no way that he would have turned to a man. And oh, was, no way, no way, no way. And I just remember thinking, man, I can't believe that we're still in my, our careers where in 2022 or 2021 at the time, a judge could think that that's okay. And I think in his mind, he thought, well, maybe I'm just helping her, but really yeah. what he was doing is he was uncomfortable because I yeah. was doing my job. And, yeah. um, and you know what? it all turned out. Okay. Why? Because we won. 
every yeah. issue. Wow. So, so anyways, it's just, it's a continual battle that we have to do. And I'm grateful that there's other women like you that are, are doing it. I love that. I love that story, by the way. I'm so glad you won. <laughs> you did. It was amazing. So that's awesome. <laughs> anyways, well, great. Thank you so much for being on my show, Kathleen. It was a pleasure. Um, I continue to wish you all the best of luck and everything and success that you're doing right now. Okay. Well, thank you so much. You have a good one. Okay. Okay. That is another episode of no one dies from divorce until next week. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed, please subscribe, follow, and share. I'd love to hear your questions and feedback. You can contact me at community at jillcoil.com. See you next time. I am an attorney, but I am not your attorney. Any advice given on the podcast is general and shall not be construed as legal advice.